can't do it. That's probably the best day of your life. When you recognize your limitations, when you recognize that you can't do it, and you're willing at that point to turn it over to God, and you're on the verge of seeing some exciting things as God begins to work, work things out for his glory in your life. And as you see then the victories of the Lord, you go your way rejoicing in what God has done. To God be the glory, great things he has done. I think that our world is in a real mess. I hear the news, I read the news, I get special briefings from Israel and from other places. And the world is in a real mess today. Our nation is in a mess. Our community is in a mess. It's desperate. The, the whole social order is just in such a mess. Desperate days. But the biggest problem is, though the times are desperate, the church is not desperate in prayer before God. And we need to really get desperate in prayer. We need to really gather together and to pray more. We've got this special time. We're here in the tent for a few weeks. We need to be in much prayer that we might see a powerful move of God's Holy Spirit that will begin to change our community and begin to affect communities around us. It's nothing for God to help. You know, we look at the social problems and we see the killings and, and, and the gangs and so forth, and we think, oh my, what are we going to do? This is terrible. You know, and yes, it is. But rather than throwing up our hands in despair and just wringing our hands and saying, oh, things are so horrible, we have a way of solving the problem. Not ourselves, but we have the privilege and the power of prayer. And we can see God move in a mighty way if we will just but pray. And so I'm encouraging you, I'm exhorting you to pray to really get desperate in prayer before God. For the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this privilege of being able to call upon you and know that you hear us and to have your promise that you would answer us and show us great and mighty things. Lord, we're looking forward to those great and mighty things. And so, Lord, we pray that we might accept this challenge and that we might join our hearts together in prayer for the move of your Spirit in and through these meetings, Father, that our whole community might be shaken by the power of your spirit. Nothing for you, Lord. Accomplish, we pray, your work in us and through us. And while our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to ask you today that you would covenant with me to pray, to pray during this period that we are in the tent, and then as we move back into the sanctuary, that you will covenant with me, that you will pray with me for a mighty move of God's Spirit in and through our lives, through the church, that we might see our community really changed for good. If you will covenant with me, I ask you to just lift up your hand and you're saying, I will covenant with you, I will pray with you that God might just really work mightily during this time and that we might see 
the hand of God. Oh, praise the Lord. Thank you. And I'm excited. <laughs> I can't wait to just see what God is going to do as we pray together and as we see the work of God's Spirit in our midst. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here at the front, and if you are in need of prayer today, maybe you are in a situation as was Asa, where you can't see any way out. There's a real problem, and you don't know what the answer is. They're here to pray for you today, to help you to discover the work of God on your behalf. And so we would encourage you, as we're dismissed, just make your way forward, and let them pray with you and pray for you, and we'll just watch God work in a very special way. The Lord bless thee, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you. See you tonight. The Bible tells us a lot about our coming king. And tonight we'd like to talk about the coming of our king. Tonight, coming for his church. He will be coming one day with his church. But before he comes with his church, he's coming for his church. And it's important that we can distinguish between his coming for his church and his coming with his church. Tonight we want to talk about his coming for his church. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, Paul wrote, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which have died, that you should sorrow as others which have no hope. For we believe that even as Jesus died and rose again, so also those which have died in Jesus will God bring with him when he comes. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. When Paul came to Thessalonica, he wasn't able to spend too much time because shortly after he came, a certain Jews came to stir up problems within the city, and Paul had to leave abruptly from Thessalonica. But many people had received Jesus Christ through Paul's ministry, and Paul was sharing with them the glorious kingdom of God that Jesus was going to set up upon the earth. And some of the believers in the church had died. And not fully understanding the teaching of the kingdom of God, they were sorrowing over the fact that their friends, some of them had died before the Lord came to establish the kingdom. And so Paul is writing his letter to the church to encourage them, to comfort them and to correct their mistaken notion because they thought because their friends had died before the Lord returned 
that their friends were going to miss out on the kingdom of God, and they were so looking forward to being able to live in the glorious conditions when the kingdom of God has come to the earth. And, and they felt like, poor Joe, he died, and died before the Lord came, and now he's missing out. So Paul is writing to correct that mistaken notion. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those that have died, that your sorrow is like those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus both died and rose again, so also those who have died in Jesus will God bring with him when he comes. For this we say by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord are not going to precede them who sleep or who have died. In reality, they have preceded us. But the Lord is going to descend from heaven with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That word translated caught up in the Greek is harpazo. And the Greek word means to be snatched away with force. In the Latin Vulgate translation, the Latin word is rapere or raptus, and from that word rapere, we get our word rapture. So there are people that say, well, the word rapture isn't in the Bible, and, and thus, you know, I don't believe in the rapture of the church. Well, it all depends on what Bible you're reading. If you're reading the Latin Bible, yes, it is there. And uh, it is the same Greek word, harpazo, which is caught up or snatched away. What we learn concerning the rapture of the church from this text is that those believers who have died will be coming with Jesus when he comes for us. That we will not precede them, but they have preceded us. That the Lord himself will descend with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. But the Lord is not coming to the earth at this time. But we who are alive and remain to the coming will be caught up to meet the Lord with the air, in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We believe in the rapture of the church because Jesus had said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So Jesus promised that he would come and receive us unto himself, that where he is, there we will be also, forever with our Lord. For a time in heaven, perhaps seven years, according to certain indications in the scripture, but then Jesus will come again, the second coming. We'll be talking about this next Sunday night. He'll be coming to establish the kingdom of God upon the earth, and when he does, we'll be coming with him. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall we also appear with him in glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 51, Paul says, Behold, I will show you a mystery. We're not of all of us going to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. 
For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. And then will be brought to pass the saying, O death, where is thy victory? O grave, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? What does this tell us about the rapture? Well, it tells us it's going to take place very quickly, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, that it will be at the last trump. Now, this is not to be confused with the seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation, as many people do. The seventh trumpet in the book of Revelation follows the great tribulation period. And so from that, they teach that the church is going through the great tribulation. We'll be dealing with this in a subsequent study on Sunday night, the church and the great tribulation. But they use this passage that it is the last trump, and in the book of Revelation, there are seven trumpet judgments. These angels are given the trumpets, and uh, with each trumpet, there is a subsequent judgment taking place upon the earth. But there's a difference between the trump of God at the rapture of the church and the seventh or the last of the trumpet judgments because those are the trumpets of the angels when the angel began to sound the seventh trumpet. This is called the trump of God. It is different. At this trump of God, when the church is caught up, when the church is raptured, that's going to be a glorious experience. I hope I'm here when that happens. I hope I'm standing behind the pulpit when that happens. <laughs> Lord, if you want to do it right now, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm right where I'd like to be. The seventh trumpet is declared to be a woe. When the fourth trumpet has sounded, the angel said, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the three trumpets that are yet to sound. When the fifth trumpet sounds, again, it declares that one woe is past and two woes are yet to come. When the sixth trumpet sounds, it's declared the second woe is past, and the third woe is coming quickly. So the seventh trumpet is a trumpet of woe, rather than a trumpet of hallelujah, praise God, the church is raptured from the earth. This scripture teaches that when that happens, we're going to go through a metamorphosis. This body will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. We will have our new incorruptible bodies. Our bodies have been given to us by our parents and by their genealogies so that as you examine the genes in your body, you can be traced to your parents and, and the family and so forth because of the similarity of the genetic structure of the body. But through the centuries, there has been a breakdown, and our bodies are corruptible. That is, they are changing. <laughs> and when you get to be my age, you really understand the changes that are taking place in this body as this corruption, this corruptible body, is not what it used to be. But we're going to put on incorruption. This mortal that is subject to death will have an immortal body. Now, you might ask, what, what, what prophecies are necessary 
that they have to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church takes place. In reality, there are no signs or prophecies that must be fulfilled before the rapture takes place. The rapture could take place at any time. We do know that the rapture will precede the second coming of Jesus by probably a period of seven years so that prophecies that do deal with the second coming of Jesus, which are very prevalent in our world today, that when we see the prophecies being fulfilled that will precede the second coming of Jesus, if those prophecies are being fulfilled, we know that the rapture has to be very, very close because it does precede the second coming of Jesus. As far as the rapture, Jesus always left it as something that could happen at any time. And he wanted the church to live in the expectancy of his imminent return because it gives, first of all, an urgency to the task that we have of bringing the gospel to the, our world. We don't have much time, and it gives an urgency to getting the gospel out. Secondly, it is an incentive for pure living. John wrote, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't yet appear what we're going to be, but we know that when he appears, we're going to be like him, for we will see him as he is. And then John adds, and he who has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. To realize that Jesus could come at any moment is a real incentive for pure living. There are many things that I do not and would not want to be doing when Jesus returns in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. Surely there will be no opportunity at that time to repent. There will be no opportunity to get right with God. You will either be ready or you won't be ready when the Lord comes for his church. It also helps me to maintain a right attitude towards the world in which I live, toward the material things of this world. As Paul is writing to the Corinthians concerning the coming of the Lord and warning them that the time is short, he said, we don't really have any time for becoming involved in worldly things. In fact, he said, let your every contact with the world be as light as possible. Hang loose. Don't get so attached that when the Lord comes for his church, I say, wait a minute, Lord, because that moment, the twinkling of an eye, will come very rapidly. Concerning his rapture of the church, Jesus said, watch and be ready. And he gave a series of parables that each one of them had as its thrust the importance of watching and the importance of being ready. He speaks about, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days of Noah, they were eating and drinking until Noah went into the ark. And they were caught by surprise when the flood came. Business as usual. They weren't expecting the judgment of God to come. 
They were just going on business as usual. And, and Jesus is saying that's the condition the world will be in when he comes for his church. The world will be going on with business as usual. It will catch the world completely and totally by surprise. Jesus said, watch therefore, for you know not at what hour your Lord is coming. If the man of the house had known in what watch the thief was coming, he would have watched and his house would not have been broken into. Therefore, be ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man is coming. He spoke of the faithful servant and the evil servant. He said, who is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them their meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, will find him so doing. That is, will find him doing the will of the Lord. But he said, if the evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, and he begins to smite his fellow servants, he begins to eat and drink and get drunk, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he's not looking for him, in an hour when he's not expecting him, and will cut him off and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. Jesus spoke of the ten virgins. Five were wise and five were foolish. And they were waiting for the bridegroom to come. And they were slumbering and sleeping when the call went out, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they awoke. They began to trim their lamps. But the five foolish virgins found out that the oil in their lamp was depleted. And so they sought to get the oil from the wise virgins, and they said, no, if we give to you, we won't have enough for ourselves. You better go see if you can buy some. And while they were away trying to buy the oil, the bridegroom came, and we read, those that were ready went in. So you see, in each of the situations that he brought up, the, the thrust was the importance of being ready, the importance of watching, because it could happen at any time and you won't have a forewarning of it. Thus, you need to be ready, you need to be watching. When the foolish virgins returned and sought entry, it was not given to them. Jesus then said, Watch, therefore, for you know not the day or the hour that the Son of Man is coming. In Hebrews 9.28 we read, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation unto them that look for him. I think that the Lord expects us and wants us to be looking for him, to be watching for him, and to be ready when he comes. I believe that in the book of Revelation, we are given sort of a chronology of the events that will be taking place in the future from the time that the book of Revelation was given to John. It was a book that was unveiling. Apocalypse was uh, the Greek word for revelation, and that is the unveiling. God is unveiling the future to John. And in chapter 1, he gives to him the formula to understand the book of Revelation. It is divided into three parts. Verse 19 of chapter 1, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will be, 
after these things. Write the things which you have seen. John writes in chapter 1 the vision that he had of the glorified Christ standing in the midst of his churches holding the pastors in his right hand. Chapters 2 and 3, the things which are, the things of the church, the things of church history. And in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus addresses the seven churches. You have the complete history of the church demonstrated in the events that were taking place in these seven churches. And you find the chronology of church history in these seven churches of the book of Revelation. It closes with the apostate church of Laodicea in the last days. But there is also a true church, and that is the church of Philadelphia. And to that church, Jesus said, because you have kept the word of my patience, I will keep you from the great tribulation that is coming to try men who dwell upon the earth. To the apostate church of Thyatira, he said, unless you repent, I will cast you into the great tribulation. But to the church of Philadelphia, the promise to keep them from the great tribulation. Chapter 4 begins with the words, after these things. In the Greek, it is metatauta, and it is the same word that is used in chapter 1, verse 19, when the Lord said, I will show you the things, uh, you know, write the things, rather, that you have seen, the things which are, the things of the church, and the things which will be after these things, metatauta. So chapter 4 opens with the words metatauta, which is immediately should put up a flag in your mind and say, wait a minute, we're entering into the third section of the book of Revelation. We're entering into the things which are going to take place after these things. Naturally, the question would be, what are these things? And quite obviously, they would be the things of Chapters 2 and 3, the things of the church. What's going to happen to the world after the ministry of the church no longer is here? What's going to happen after the church has been raptured and taken into heaven? And from here, chapter 6 through chapter 18, you have the events that will take place on the world, in the world, after the church is taken out, the events of the great tribulation. John said, after these things, the things of the church, I saw a door open in heaven, and the voice was as of a trumpet saying, come up hither, and I will show you things that must be after these things. The repetition of the word meditata to make sure that you caught it, we're going into the final section of the book of Revelation, things of the future after the church has completed her witness upon the earth. After these things, the door open in heaven. I believe that here John is raptured, taken into heaven to behold the things that are going to be happening in heaven with the church as he describes in chapters 4, 5, and 6, or actually 4 and 5, it's chapter 6, we come back and see the things that will happen on the earth as they relate to the things that are happening in heaven. But John is taken into heaven, and he briefly describes the heavenly scene. He sees there the throne of God the glassy sea before the throne of God. 
he sees the cherubim, these angels, who are around the throne of God, worshiping God day and night as they declare, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is, which was, and which is to come. John observes these 24 lesser thrones with the 24 elders sitting on them. And as the cherubim are worshiping God, declaring the holiness of God and his eternal nature, these elders fall on their faces, they take their golden crowns, cast them on the glassy sea, and declare the worthiness of God to receive the glory and the honor and the power because he has created all things and for his pleasure they are and were created. I'd like to pause there for just a moment. They're declaring that God has created all things for his good pleasure. That includes you. You exist for God's good pleasure. That's the purpose of your existence. And anything else, you are falling short of God's purpose for your existence. You were created for his good pleasure. You say, well, I don't appreciate that. Tough. 